Hello, and thank you for tuning in to another lecture on research methods. Today we're going to talk about qualitative research. Before we begin, let's just start by just reminding ourselves what we've done last week. So last week we've looked at choosing and devising an appropriate methodology for our study. Specifically, we had talked about participant recruitment. We also discussed materials that we could use for our studies, such as word lists, a set of pictures and things like that. And also we talked about the task that we're setting up for participants, the procedures which would tie up our participants with our materials and instruct them on how to engage with the materials. So today and in the next week, we're going to continue looking at research methodology, but we're also broadening our scope. Back to discussing what a research question is, we're also going to look at the types of data that we can collect in linguistics and applied linguistics research, how we interpret the data and how we write it up in a final report. All of those questions are going to be addressed in the light of comparing qualitative and quantitative studies. So the focus of today's lecture is qualitative research. We're going to begin by providing a definition and discussing some features of qualitative research. Then we're going to go through the core study types in qualitative research. I'm going to focus particularly on case studies and on ethnography. But we're also going to very briefly go through some other study types as well. Then we'll proceed to discuss qualitative data collection procedures, such as observation, interview and questionnaire, which we have already talked about before. And we're also going to talk about discourse analysis. And then we will conclude by discussing the strength and weaknesses of qualitative research. OK, let's start. So let's begin with an overview of qualitative research. We're going to start this overview by discussing its definition. You already know that qualitative research is an entire research family along with quantitative research which means that it comprises many different research techniques. The way we define qualitative research is we say that it's the type of research that focuses on meaning making. So it aims at answering these very big general questions about the world around us, such as what's going on? Why is a certain phenomenon occurring? And how do we understand this phenomenon? Or what is the process that is behind this phenomenon? So all of these questions are aimed at making sense of the world around us. It's also the research that presents the collected data in words and not numbers. So you're not very likely to find a qualitative research study that discusses the results of a statistical model, for example. The discussion of results, rather, is going to contain different codes, labels, narratives and vignettes, rather than statistical significance or the results of statistical tests. So you will not typically find numerical data in qualitative research. And then finally, we'll also look at qualitative research as the type of research that analyzes the data by interpretative means, which once again is very closely connected with the meaning-making aspect of qualitative research. And it stands for the researcher trying to shed light on a particular issue or a particular problem by interpreting collected data. Qualitative research is employed in many different academic disciplines. Traditionally, it has been associated with the social sciences, such as anthropology and philosophy. But more recently, it has been introduced in more disciplines and applied fields as well. For example, psychology, education, linguistics and applied linguistics, 
but also policy analysis, business studies, law, as well as medical and environmental research. The assumptions that qualitative research makes about our world is that reality is multifaceted, complex, socially constructed, which means that it's inherently subjective and can only be researched holistically. And that last point leads us to think that the variables or phenomena under investigation are assumed to be very complex and interconnected, making them difficult to measure and isolate for the study. So let's say we would like to investigate the maintenance of heritage languages in multilingual communities, which would be a lot of different immigrant communities in Australia where English would be the dominant language of the wider society, but at home people might use other languages. And then those communities would also speak another or more than one heritage language at home. And so we're interested that what do they do to preserve those languages in their family and community? And if we're interested in a question like that, we may need to look at a lot of different factors, such as, for instance, perceived language prestige of the heritage language versus the dominant society language. And a lot of different languages hold different perceived linguistic prestige. So, for example, some of the European languages are perceived to have very high prestige. And so maybe it's easier to maintain them rather than languages that have lower social prestige or linguistic prestige. We can also look at language policies in Australia, educational policies that are adopted in the schools within the communities, which also at the availability of different services and media in the heritage languages. Because that would make the heritage language more accessible and would encourage the speakers of a heritage language to actually maintain their proficiency. We can also look at the sociolinguistic and sociocultural affiliation of individuals. So, is it their preference to conform to the wider society? Or would they rather like to strongly maintain their cultural identity? To explore these questions, we can examine for example, the code switching patterns of those individuals. So to say whether English creeps into that utterance or utterances in the heritage language, we can also look at their generational factors and the identity issues within a particular individual and many, many other factors. So according to qualitative research, those factors are not really existing independently of one another. And it's really hard to single out without having some influence of the other factors on the target question. The nature of qualitative research is exploratory. So the aim is often to discover new ideas and gain new insights into phenomena that the researcher observes in their day-to-day -day lives. So here's a research question one may propose. How do different communities in Australia maintain the heritage language? You would notice that this question has still room to grow and emerge, and the researcher may not start with a specific research question, even though we have discussed that starting with a very particular question is a good practice because it helps guide our research. In qualitative research, it's quite common to start with a research purpose rather than research question or a broader area of interest, which is sometimes referred to as research inquiry. As the research question emerges, we could also describe qualitative research as being non-linear because the research question can be reworked or refined as the project is being undertaken and new insights are being gained in many different ways. So for instance, the example above 
may be changed to focus on generational differences in heritage language maintenance. So whether the second generation or the third generation of immigrants have different attitudes towards their heritage language and heritage language maintenance. We can also focus on differences according to the cultural group. So what kind of heritage language and what heritage culture are we examining? Or, for example, if looking at the influence of social media on language maintenance, there could be a lot of other possibilities that the researcher decides to take. So that's what is meant by non-linear. The possibilities of adjusting and reworking our initial research questions are endless, and they are very much dependent on the context in which the study is occurring. Qualitative research is also described as being inductive, which means that we start with a, an individual observation or maybe a group of in, uh, observations. And they are very idiosyncratic, so specific to the context and the setting in which they occur. Then, from that observation, we hopefully work out a pattern of certain behaviours. If we are focusing on studies in linguistics and applied linguistics, based on the patterns that we observe, we can propose a working hypothesis which is a bit broader and a bit more generalized than the specific pattern. And then we can go ahead and test that hypothesis uh, to propose a theory that would apply to a wider population. In saying that, however, it is important to understand qualitative research does not aim to be predictive or generalizable. So while some studies may end up proposing a theory based on their initial observations, patterns and their hypothesis testing. It is not the target of qualitative research because the target is to explore one particular scenario in great depth. And it is important to understand that this scenario might differ uh, from the next in many different ways. And this may not be generalizable to either another case or even to the wider population. OK, we are moving on to features of qualitative research. So here we could say that qualitative research focuses on participants' interaction with experiences with a view on certain phenomena. So here we highlight once again the subjectivity of qualitative research. Those interactions, experiences and views are ideally explored in the natural setting. So in their community, in the language classroom, at home, in the workplace, online or in natural conversation. And the researcher exercises no or very minimal intervention on the research process. So the setting is not controlled, created or set up. The researcher aims to observe the participants and the participants' behaviour in as natural a setting as possible. So here we really strive to be in a natural setting and the setting should be natural in contrast to artificial or controlled. So to highlight those features, I found a couple of quotes that I'd like to share with you. The first one is that qualitative researchers go to the people. They do not extricate people from their everyday worlds. In examining this quote, I'd like for you to think whether this aligns more with the definition of fieldwork or desk work. So that's something we'll come back to in our tutorial. And then the second quote is by William Labaf, who is considered to be the founding father of modern day social linguistics, the study of language and society. And so he says that the aim of linguistic research is in 
in the community must be to find out how people talk when they're not being systematically observed. Yet, we can only obtain this data by systematic observation. So, he highlights um, what is known as the observer's paradox, or sometimes the observer effect. And what I'd like for you to reflect on is how we can overcome this observer's paradox. So how can we achieve gaining those natural behaviors from people when they know that they are being studied uh, or being observed? Once again, this question is something that we are going to come back to in our tutorial. Okay, so to wrap up the features of qualitative research, it is also important to highlight that the purpose of qualitative research is to analyze and study um, with the aim of interpreting or contextualizing and understanding um, a variety of participants' perspective on the phenomena under investigation. Once again, you will note that there is no aiming to um, summarize those perspectives. We're treating them as individual points of view and we're aiming to gain an in-depth comprehension of each of those. Data in qualitative research is analyzed by themes and categories or categorization. And research reports include many quotes from participants to illustrate the points and the arguments that the researcher is trying to make. And as a result, the write-up of a research paper or a research thesis using a qualitative approach will be uh, very descriptive in nature. So now that we're familiar with the nature and the core features of qualitative research, let's look at some of the qualitative study types. And we're going to start with examining case studies. So, in the case of case studies, the scope of the investigation is determined by the researcher's interest. In many sources, you will see that case studies are referred to as being bounded systems, which means that the scope and the interest of the researcher is the determining factor of what is being investigated. In a case study, Three different types of case studies are identified depending on how narrow or how wide that interest or the scope is. So the first type is an intrinsic case study, which means that we're focusing on describing an individual case of a particular person. And here our aim is just to provide a very detailed and in-depth description of that behavior, their experience, or their opinions on a particular phenomenon. If we stick to our example of heritage language maintenance, we can pose a question like, how is this individual maintaining the heritage language? In this case, we're not interested in any way of extrapolating or comparing our findings to other external cases. Our goal is solely in describing this particular individual. The second type of case study is an instrumental case study. So here, we once again are very narrowly focused on exploring a particular issue. However, unlike the intrinsic case study, um, instrumental case studies presuppose some interpretation in addition to the description. So here we can ask a question like, how can heritage language maintenance be better supported based on the account provided by an individual under investigation? So here we start with describing an individual case, the experiences and their opinions, but then we take it a step further. Based on this account, we provide some suggestions or we explore the issue that has been raised by an individual. And then finally, we can identify collective or multiple case studies. So here we focus on both describing and evaluating 
but this time we're looking at multiple cases in light of a particular issue. So the question we can ask here could be why some individuals are more successful in maintaining their heritage language than others. And what can be done to better support heritage language maintenance? Here, we explore a group dynamic about a particular issue. Usually, that group is not too big, and the individuals and participants in that case study are somehow interconnected. So they may be belong to the same location, go to the same school, or have pre-existing relationships be before the case study begins. So when we define a case study, we need to understand what we mean by case. And this is explained differently depending on the area of your research interest. So for example, in the studies of second language acquisition, linguistics and applied linguistics, or social linguistics and psycholinguistics, a case study is usually focusing on the single individual or sometimes a small group. In second language acquisition, we can sometimes also look at institutions. So for instance, a classroom, a department, or a faculty at a university, even a university as a whole. But in other studies, for example, in political studies, a case may represent a large entity, such as a state or a country. Now, ethnographic studies are another big group of qualitative research studies in applied linguistics and linguistics. And they aim to describe people's behavior in naturally occurring ongoing settings through prolonged observation. So through this definition, I'm hoping that you're able to identify those ethnographic studies uh, by nature are longitudinal and that observed behavior needs to be interpreted through a cultural lens. So this is one of the key features that distinguishes an ethnography from a case study. While a case study may also look at people's behavior in natural occurring ongoing settings, it doesn't always have to be uh, connected uh, to the cultural background of the group. While in ethnography study or ethnographic study, uh, basically the people's culture is at the core of what you want to understand and how you look at the phenomenon. Now, because culture is not specific to an individual, but rather unites a group of people, the focus of an ethnographic study or of an ethnography uh, is also on the group rather than individuals and the processes that occur in that group. <coughs> so what we mean by those processes are some traditions or customs, expected behaviors um, in that group. So what they do, the linguistic behavior, what they say, group membership and gatekeeping. And we can address questions like, how is this group able to identify who's an insider and who's an outsider of the group? And what kind of measures are they taking to maintain this distinction between insiders and outsiders? Ethnographic research actually began as the study of less known cultures. But as the researchers have realized that a cultural lens can be applied to the communities that they're part of, ethnography actually lost its focus on the other. And now a wide variety of communities are studied through the ethnographic and cultural lens. Groups either share the same location, which has been the traditional ethnographic approach, or a particular feature. So for instance, a group that could be a subject to an ethnographic study could work in the same industry, communicate in the same uh, websites or blogs, or even belong to the same generation. So for instance, we can talk about millennial culture, but those groups do not necessarily have to live in the same location or in the same place. The results of an ethnographic study is typically a comprehensive cultural portray of a group and their linguistic behavior if we're talking about linguistic and applied linguistic research. 
So once again, here we may want to look at things like cultural influence and heritage language maintenance in Lebanese Arabic immigrant communities in Australia. Once again, here I'd like to highlight that the cultural angle is what separates the ethnography from a case study. Okay, so a case study and ethnography are the two core study techniques or study methodologies that are often employed in qualitative research. But qualitative research is by no means restrained to those two methodologies. And here, on this slide, I'm just going to briefly introduce some other qualitative study types. So the first one is action research. And this is something that we've been discussing before briefly, but we'll come back to it in a separate lecture. So action research is a safe reflective process and approach to researching one's own professional practices with practical outcomes to improve one's professional goals or one's professional careers and outcomes. So action research is applicable in many different fields, such as learning and teaching a second language, interpreting and translating, and even research practices relating to applied linguistics and second language research. Narrative inquiry is an analysis of a person's life through a collection of stories about the experiences. Narrative inquiry have been widely implemented in second language studies as a person's life, say, if it's an immigrant, is closely interconnected with their progress in the acquisition of the target language. So sometimes a story of their life is very reflective of the story of their progress as a learner of a second language. And then one last study type that I'd like to introduce today is phenomenology. So phenomenology is a study that collects subjective experiences, opinions and meanings from several individuals about a single phenomenon. And th so through this diversity of opinions, you're trying to paint a more comprehensive worldview about a particular issue or a particular problem. Now, let us turn to qualitative data collection procedures. So the tasks that the participants may be presented with if they decide to contribute to qualitative research. One of the common causes of data collection procedures is observation which means that we notice and record the natural behaviours of our participants as they go about their daily lives. So observations fall into several different categories. We can distinguish between structured versus casual or unstructured observations. So when a researcher undertakes a structured observation, it means that they have a checklist of certain behaviours that they need to pay attention to which means data coding and processing are a much more streamlined process. However, it means that some other behaviours that may also be interesting go unnoticed. In casual observation, a researcher does not have a checklist of things to look for, out for. And so, therefore, the task is to just notice and observe any patterns that seem relevant to the interest of the research question. In this case, data processing can be fairly time consuming just because of the richness of the data. But some more interesting patterns may emerge and may serve as the basis for narrowing down the research question. Observational research also varies based on the role that the researcher takes. We can distinguish between the complete observer and the participant observer. So a complete observer is a researcher that is unknown to the participant group that's under investigation that ensures that most natural behavior from those participants because they do not feel observed. However, it also raises ethical problems. Obviously, nobody would like to be observed without knowing that they're actually under observation. Participant observer means that the researcher 
is a part of the community that has been observed and they participate in their daily lives. So this is more ethically sound. However, this raises the question of the observer's ob objectivity versus subjectivity because they're involved in the process under study. And so it's sometimes questionable whether they're able to interpret something from a distance if they've been involved in something. Another very common qualitative data collection procedure is an interview. And that's something that we have discussed in last week's tutorial. So interviews, once again, can fall into several categories based on how structured they are. And for qualitative data collection, we usually go with unstructured or semi-structured interviews. Unstructured interviews pretty much advocate for the researcher to listen to the participant. In semi-structured interviews, the interview guides the interviewing process uh, a little bit more actively and tries to elicit certain responses or ask more questions. Asking a question is also a very useful technique in qualitative research, particularly if we look at open-ended questions. So here I'd like to make a quick note that we have talked about observations, interviews and the questions in last week's tutorial. However, in this week's tutorial, we're going to continue talking about those three procedures. And we're going to do a quick observation practice. And we're going to go through the do's and the don'ts of interview and questionnaire design. Because it can actually be quite tricky and a lot can go wrong when you're interviewing people. Interviewing is actually something that someone needs to practice. And for some, it's more difficult to acquire than for others. A focus group is somewhere in between the interview and the questionnaire. So you can think of a focus group as, a multi as multiple interviews with people from diverse backgrounds discussing the same topic or voicing their opinions on the same issue. So here you get the benefit of the multiple interviews but also the group dynamic. So it may be a bit more efficient to conduct a focus group than an individual interview. Focus groups are also perceived to be less confronting than an individual interview, much like a questionnaire is because a participant in a focus group does not necessarily express their opinions directly to the researcher. So sometimes when you're not feeling quite confident about the topic. In a group interview, it's easier to basically step back. Whereas if you're in a one-to-one -one conversation or a one-to-one -one interview, then it's rather difficult. And researchers need to pay attention, not to overstep boundaries and make the people that they interview or the interviewees feel confronted. A diary is a method of data collection that reflects the first person opinions and introspective journals of a participant. So here you get quite a large amount of data and rich data, but diaries also raise a question of participants' subjectivity because diaries are just by definition someone's subjective opinion. And even more so if people study their own diaries. So here the problems or issues related to subjectivity and generalizability really come into play. And then finally, discourse analysis is also a procedure that is very widely employed in qualitative research. And that's basically an extension of language use in both speech and writing. And that's also the topic that we will come back to in a separate week. So obviously, before starting a research project, researchers need to make an informed decision on whether qualitative research is the right approach for the research purpose. They must be aware that the research strength and weaknesses of this particular approach can be advantageous to study a certain phenomenon or disadvantageous. So we're going to start at looking at the advantages and disadvantages or the strength and weaknesses of qualitative research. One of the key advantages 
of qualitative research or the qualitative approach is that it provides an in-depth and rich description of a phenomenon, which is much more in line with how we see and understand the reality around us in all of its complexity and interconnection between the different factors. In addition to that, qualitative research may serve as a very important step from the inception of an idea to a more general and comprehensive conceptual framework. In one of the first weeks, we've discussed that some of the exploratory studies may not aim to provide or propose specific hypotheses or test specific theories. But those exploratory studies are necessary to be able to devise those more specific research questions and predictions in future research. This means that qualitative analyses basically oftentimes set the starting ground for then more focused and more specific you know, quantitative analyses. Also, qualitative research allows for a very vivid and meaningful look into an issue with concrete examples which may be more accessible and convincing to the reader or the audience to which this research is presented. And if we perceive this reader or the audience to be a policy maker in, say, bilingual education or a practitioner, like a second language teacher or an interpreter, it may seem that those vivid examples are preferable as they may be less dry or difficult to interpret and detached from the individual as numeric accounts of the data may be. However, they are also perceived to be sometimes a little bit too subjective and unreliable. And speaking of this, we are now looking at the weaknesses of qualitative research. And we need to start by acknowledging that the data collection and processing in qualitative studies are extremely labor and time intensive. Not only have we highlighted that some of the procedures involve prolonged observations, but the data coding and data processing itself may require a lot of different steps that also consume a lot of the researcher's time. So, for instance, after conducting an interview, you also need to transcribe the recorded interview data to be able to find patterns and code certain utterances produced by the participant. And transcription is really time intensive. It may take 10 or even 20 or 30 times the amount of time to transcribe a conversation than the time it took for the conversation to take place. And as I said before, there's also a certain level of subjectivity in qualitative research. And that may come from a couple of different sources. Firstly, it could be the researcher's bias that is specifically prevalent. And that might be if the researcher is not a passive observer, but is more emerged in the situation under investigation. To a certain degree, this can be combated if the researcher employs the method of triangulation, which means that they could use more than one scientific method to collect data which would serve as a guard against such biases, but only to a certain extent. Then there's also participant bias as well, which stems from obtaining an emetic or an insider point of view. So for instance, if we conduct an interview or if we ask our participants to submit a diary, by definition, the data that we're getting is going to be representative of their subjective point of view. Generalizability of findings is also an issue for qualitative research due to the idiosyncratic nature of the investigation. So we've mentioned before, one case is very unlikely to be generalizable. So it might not necessarily be a very good example or might be not very informative for other cases. And then finally, credibility and quality of conclusions in qualitative research may be questioned by some as as they are subject to interpretation by the researcher. And interpretations may vary according to the theoretical context that this particular researcher subscribes to, but also according to their personal experiences.
To, com to combat those weaknesses, researchers are encouraged to employ both qualitative and quantitative techniques and thus conduct mixed studies to obtain both subjective and objective uh, looks at the data or at a certain problem. So let me conclude this lecture by highlighting a few key points that I'd like to uh, I'd like you to remember. So first of all, let's start with the definition of qualitative research. Qualitative research aims to capture and interpret the complexity of the real world through individual or group perspective and describe it through words rather than numbers. So qualitative research does not shy away from the diversity or the complexity of a multitude of opinions. Rather, qualitative research uses this diversity and analyzes it through theme analysis, interpretation and categorization. Also, qualitative research usually supplies real vivid examples and quotes obtained from the participants. Qualitative research obtains data that is extremely rich in detail, which is both a strength and a weakness. It is a strength because it gives us a comprehensive account of the collected data and the participants' behavior and their opinions. But it is weakness because such rich data doesn't allow for quick processing or analysis. Because these findings are extremely contextualized, which means that their specific particular setting may not be informative for other cases or may not be representative for the wider population. One of the main criticisms of qualitative research is that it is very subjective and does not lend itself to generalizability. That's it for today's lecture. Thank you very much and I hope to see you again next week. Bye bye.